Jim talked about the Song of the Lamb, the Song of Moses. And you know, that's talking about those who overcome. It's talking about those who are not going to be ruled by the mark of the beast and so on. So who are they? The ones who have the foundation of the law and the ones who have the fulfillment of that law in Christ. So you have the Song of Moses is the Old Testament and the Song of the Lamb is the New Covenant. Amen? And this morning, uh, I get up bright and early, much earlier than I wanted to, of course. And, you know, when you wake up and you can't get back to sleep, that's a bit of a drag, isn't it? So I'm up real early, and uh, then I turn on the television, and I'm watching uh, somebody preaching. And it started with uh, Perry Stone. And just happened to be Perry Stone was talking about the ten virgins. Oh, wow. And that's what I'm going to preach on today. Oh, wow. Part of it anyway, a very large part of it. Um, I kept waiting for him to uh, uh, reveal what it's all about. Sorry, maybe next time. But I think I might have an answer or two. So let's just w wait and see, shall we? So I want to talk about being transformed today because that really is the heart of the message. Be transformed. Now you hear it from me all the time, I know. Do you get sick of it? Well, it doesn't matter. You're going to hear it over and over and over and over, and over again because that's what it's all about. It's about what you become, not what you do. Amen? Because what you do will have a lot to, have, a lot to do with what you are and what you become. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words, and that which was written was upright, even words of truth. Let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Be transformed. Luke 12, verses 35 to 37 says, Let your waist be girded and your lamps burning. And you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and will come and serve them. He will serve them. Isn't that amazing? Well, this is a call to vigilance. You know what vigilance is? To be ready. Be circumspect. Circum. Specio spectus, I see. To see, see around. Circumspect. There's a Greek word. It's episteme. Episteme, and it means to stand up or to stand upon, to stand by. Be ready, be ready in season and out of season. When we see the word of God tell us that we should occupy till he comes, that's what we're talking about. It's to me, to stand by, be ready. There is a belief in the visible church that if we have enough religion, that is performance to rituals and other religious duties, that we have fulfilled all that God requires of us. I just need to be a good person. Go to church and have communion. Right? That's all that's required of me, right? Yeah? The Pharisees had the same idea. They believed that strict observance of the ordinances of Levitical law would assure them of the resurrection. See, they did, they did believe in the resurrection, but they figured the way to accomplish the resurrection or receive it is by obeying the Levitical ordinances. And they were strict about that. That's the nature of religion. Religion is external. But a relationship 
is what God offers, and it only occurs through familiarity, which is e internal. I was going to say eternal, yeah. It leads to eternity, absolutely, in the case of God. But we need to move from the out to the inner. For example, in Matthew 7, 22, Jesus tells us, get this, many will say to me that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? That's what happens for pulpits, right? Prophecy isn't telling the future. Prophecy is expounding the word of God. That's what true prophecy is. You say, oh, we prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in, in your name. We've done many wonders in your name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So you can perform all the rituals you want to and still be lawless. Because all you've really accomplished is an external yeah, type of faith. See, these people knew all the outward things to do and did them really religiously, but they kept their personal lives, that is, their inner selves, separate from all the religious stuff that should have become internalized for them. We stuck, talked a little bit about this on Friday night, how the Jews wanted to keep God outside. And in churches, a lot of people who sit in churches want to keep God outside. So their connection with him is not in a relationship, but their connection with him is in doing those things that they think he will you know, enjoy seeing, right? So they're kind of making deals with God. You know, I'll do this for you if you'll do that for me. Well, it really doesn't work that way. You know, God's not impressed by the sacrifice of bulls and goats. He's not all that impressed with ceremonies and rituals. I say it over and over again. I do believe that Jesus had no time for ceremony and ritual because he knew full well that human nature will replace the reality with the shadow if you let them. So the reason that the Levitical Jews and a lot of them even today and people who sit in church thinking that all they have to do is church attendance and a few ceremonies. The reason they want to keep God separate from them is so that they don't have to change, so they can stay the way they are, right? I can be me and have you at the same time. Well, I'm sorry, you can't. You have to become him. He said his desire is that we all be conformed to the image of the Son. There's no exception to that. And the only way that's going to happen if you, is if you allow him to make the change. He's the only one that can make it. I can't make it, and you can't make it either. It is, we are incapable of it. What we do is we say, Lord, I step aside. Help me, Lord, to follow your lead. The Pharisees were highly critical of any violation of those codes in the Levitical ordinances and very concerned with the outward appearances. See, I like people to see what they were doing, right? Watch me. You know, they don't want anybody around when they're in their inner chambers, though, do they? Nuh uh. Because that's when what's on the inside starts to show. Yet Jesus told them in Matthew 15, 11, it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a man. You can have all the 
dietary laws you want. But it's not what goes into the mouth that defies, defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles the man. He says in Matthew 15, 18, those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart and they defile a man. You know, what's on the inside will eventually come to the outside. There's no getting around it. What is it? Oh, what tangled webs we weave when first we practice to deceive. Because huh? now you've got to keep it up. See, you can't keep a secret for long. Sooner or later, that secret is going to be known. People are going to see it sooner or later. <laughs> like the old saying, three can keep a secret if two are dead. <laughs> Today... There are those who would not dream of attending church without having a communion service. We had some in here. They come once or twice, realize that, wait a minute, I don't have any rituals in here. Ah, we're gone. Right? There are those, really. They wouldn't dream of attending church without having a communion service, yet make little or no effort to feed on the Word of God, which is the very thing that the communion service is representative of. That's what the communion service is all about. Community. Community. And that community is being in one accord. And what accord is that? It's not a Honda. It's actually the Word of God. It's the Word of God. You know, that we be conformed to what God has given us to eat. It is called the bread of life for a very good reason, you know. Understand that God has made it clear in so many ways that it is not what we do that is important, but it is what we become that is important. And you will become what you eat. Right? What you feed on is what will make you into what you become. For example, a woman might be equipped to have a baby, but it doesn't necessarily follow that she will be a good mother. You know, I can prepare myself for an emergency, but how I handle that emergency is mo still mostly a matter of what I am on the inside. Right? Now we come to the heart of the matter. What is the heart of the matter? The mark. Kragma in the Greek. The mark. Where's the mark? Right here. Right here in the place of reason. The place of logic. Logos. The place of logos right here. It's kragma. The word we get, the word, the word character from. It is character. His character. Behavior issues from your character. It can be difficult to know who or what a person is just by looking at the outward appearance. It is only by engaging in conversation and establish, establishing a relationship that we can truly get to know a person for who or what that person is. One can change outward appearance quickly. But inward changes, the ones that really count, what God looks at, they take much longer to develop. They take effort. They take submission. That is what we call growth. The scriptures exhort us repeatedly to grow spiritually, and they tell us how to grow spiritually. Again, Romans 12, 1 and 2. Offer yourselves a living sacrifice, right? Submit to God. Submit to God. Say, God, I want you to reshape me. I come into, the, into this world a lump of clay, and the world wants to shape me the way the world wants me to be. But I want you to shape me the way you want me to be. Romans 12, 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why? 
so that you can become a manifestation of divine will. That's why. That you will see things as God sees things. You will react as God would react. You would behave as God would have you behave. That's what it's all about. And that's what we call growth. It is character that God seeks to develop in us. Not just character, but His character. His mark, that we bear His mark. In Romans 8.29, God reveals that His will for all people, there are no exceptions, His will for everybody is to be conformed to the image of His Son. His desire for everybody is that they be adopted into His family. His desire for everybody is that we all become members of His kingdom. What is the image of His Son? You think it's to wear sandals and grow a beard? Have long hair? Oh, and I like this one. Speak biblical phrases in Elizabethan English, right? Oh, truly thou art. <laughs> of course not. It simply means to be like him. But in what way? Kindness, honesty, courage, gentleness, Compassion? Yeah, absolutely. Certainly we will manifest these qualities if we resemble him, but even an atheist can manifest many of these qualities and still not fulfill the requirements for adoption. So just what is it that gives us kinship to Jesus? In John 14, verses 23 and 24, Jesus said, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. In John 4.34, Jesus says, My food is to do the work or the will of him who sent me and to finish his work to finish his work. And you know what his work is? His work is to prepare us for an eternity in heaven. That's his work, to prepare us for an eternity in his holy presence. <laughs> I really don't know what that's all about. But I can tell you, I have every confidence that it's going to be wonderful. And that's all I need to know, isn't it? I don't need to know any more about it, except that I will be with the one that I love. His work, not ours, issues forth from his character, from his mark. His nature is what resides within the believer who submits to a holy God. There is a preoccupation with gifts and manifestations of the Spirit these days in the church. I say it again. There is a preoccupation with gifts and manifestations of the Spirit these days in the church. Healings and exorcisms and signs and wonders are considered to be the gold standard of spiritual maturity. Do you all agree with that? It is thought that that is the gold standard. If you can cast out demons, if you can heal the sick, raise the dead, then you have the gold standard of spiritual maturity. Well, there's a bit of a problem with that. 1 John 3.8 declares that the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. It has become popular to think that the way to participate in the defeat of the devil is through healings and deliverances. Now look, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with healings and deliverances. Nothing. The trouble is when they are the focal point. That's the problem. That's always been the problem. It has become popular to think 
that the way to participate in the defeat of the devil is through healings and deliverances. And no doubt that is one way. But is it the best way? You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 talks all about the body and the different parts of the body and how they all should all work, work together. And it talks about the gifts of the Spirit and the abilities that God gives us to manifest His will. Yes, but you know, they, it, it ends that chapter and moves straight on with another chapter saying, but let me tell you the best way. You hear me? Let me tell you, all that God will give you comes from the same Spirit. All the gifts, all the gifts, but let me show you the better way. And he goes straight into love. He says, I can do all those things, but if I don't have the character of Christ, that's love. If I don't have the character of Christ in me, if that is not my focus, I have just attracted attention to myself, and that's all I've done. I've become a sounding gong. You follow me? Is everybody following me? This could be an unpopular message within the church because there is so much focus on this, particularly in the charismatic movement. There are a lot of people pushing this stuff. Some of them are pretty good, and some of them just... To, to me, they're misleading. Now, we look, we look at uh, uh, this one fellow that, uh, that I, will, I will never stop promoting, and that's, um, oh God, now I can't remember his name. <laughs> It'll come back to me. Anyway, the way to defeat the devil is mostly by becoming a son of God. That's the way to defeat the devil. Look at Matthew 7, verse 22. See, if you do this without relationship with Jesus, you can, you can heal the sick. You go down on the street and you stand on a... a, a, a Stand on a soapbox and preach and preach and preach and do a very good job. But you should first of all let people know that it is Christ in you which is the hope of glory. It's Christ in you. That's the hope of glory. And he makes himself available. He will come and be in you if that is your focus. <clears throat> and then I'll tell you what, you'll be able to heal the sick. You might even raise the dead. But that won't be your purpose. Your purpose will be a manifestation of the Son of God in you. That should be your purpose more than anything else. Because remember, Jesus said, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I believe that Jesus made it clear in so many ways that the greatest defeat of the devil is not in healings or spiritual manifestations, but in his divine character taking residence in the soul of the believer. That is what it's all about. And when that happens, absolutely, you will be able to produce those manifestations. The most important thing in Jesus' life was to do the will of the Father. And that is the true meaning of Sabbath rest. Sabbath rest is not, not working on a Saturday. Sabbath rest is doing the will of the Father. Resting in Him. That's what Sabbath rest truly is, to do the will of the Father. There are plenty of people, they want to substitute their human work for His good. So they have a Saturday rest, or they have uh, uh, fasting, going without food, or doing this or that. But it's not what you do, it's what you become that's important. 
that his will be your will. That is the true meaning of Sabbath rest. So it must be for all those who would consider themselves to be the brothers and sisters of Jesus. We must seek his will and submit to his will, and we cannot do that in our own strength. I think that Jesus was talking about that when he told us the parable of the ten virgins. So let's look at that. Matthew 25, verses 1 to 13. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were, way, were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was de delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you. But go ra rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Lord, the Son of Man, is coming." This parable has been the source of much conjecture and disagreement for many centuries. To this day, its meaning is debated. I heard Perry Stone talking about certain meanings today. Is it just speaking about being prepared? Or is it speaking about being spirit-filled, which is Christ in you? Notice, first of all, that this parable occurs only in the Gospel of Matthew. And Matthew is known as the Kingdom Gospel. Its target audience was the Jews. It was written by a Jew, about a Jew, and to the Jews. John 1.11 says, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Many of the first disciples were, in fact, Jews. Although the rulers and the nation as a whole rejected Jesus, many Jews did receive him as their Messiah. We can perhaps see these believing Jews as well as the unbelieving Jews as we read this parable. I hope you're starting to see it. Verse 2 tells us that some were foolish and some were wise. In verse 3, the foolish ones had only the oil that was in their lamps and were convinced that it was enough. What could that be? Levitical ordinances, perhaps? This is a perfect description of the Jew who would hold on to the old covenant and reject the new one being offered. The same can be said of those who believe that human morality is sufficient to get to a holy God. These are the unregenerate souls. We have them today. They are the ones who think that they have in themselves all that they need. I am a good person. But, in, but the wise, in verse 4, carried extra oil in their vessels. They, they carried in themselves the spirit of the new covenant. These are the regenerate souls. You know, like Jim was talking about today, you know, you've got to have the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. Hmm? If you just have the song of Moses, you think that's enough? That's not going to be enough. You have to have the song of the Lamb. And let me tell you, in order to have the song of the Lamb, you're going to have to have the song of Moses too. You cannot build a house without a foundation. 
There has to be a foundation. And that foundation is found in the ordinances, the Levitical ordinances, because they do talk about a, a morality. They talk about those things which are important to have to establish a culture and a society. You have to have that. That's your foundation. But then on top of that, you have to have divine viewpoint over human viewpoint. And you also have to have a savior. You have to have somebody who takes it on himself to be your Messiah. Amen? So you do have to have both songs. You have to have the old and the new in you. Remember, Jesus came to fulfill, not to do away with it, but to fulfill the old, the first covenant, right? So verse 5 tells us that both the regenerate and the unregenerate go to sleep. That is to say, they wait for the arrival of the groom. They occupy until he comes. But in verse 6, the call comes to let their light shine forth. So they all trim their wicks before lighting their lamps. But wait, some of them have no oil, like the unrepentant Jew who relied on the old covenant. It has all been spent on a life lived to self and justified by ceremony. A life lived to self and justified by ceremony. In verse 8, they were unable to light the wedding. They had a basket over their head, right? So they asked for some of the oil from the other virgins. And look at their response in verse 9. We cannot give you some of ours lest we too run out of oil. What are they saying? I believe that Jesus is telling us that we each stand responsible for our own oil. Just as salvation is individual and not corporate, so it is with, with spiritual maturity. It is individual. You cannot instantly transfer your spiritual growth to another, no matter how much you might want to. It is still and always will be, as it says in Isaiah 28, 10, word upon word, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. The believer must be transformed by the renewing of the mind, Romans 12, 2. The oil, that is the Holy Spirit. What is the Holy Spirit? It's the spirit of holiness. The Holy Spirit is the divine viewpoint taking up residence in your soul. That's what it is. Each must carry light in himself. That Holy Spirit is offered universally to all, but it is up to each to personally receive it. It's no good to think that another's light will suffice for us. Salvation is not corporate, it is individual. It is the Holy Spirit that manifests the character of Christ in a believer. And God makes him available to all who believe that Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. Only then will we receive what God offers freely to everybody through Christ. There are no exceptions. The offer is made universally. We are without excuse. If we want to continue to be my own person, you're headed for a fall. Well, you must come to the realization that my own person is filthy rags. Now I don't care how honest you are. I don't care how good you are. I don't care what, what things you do that are so righteous until you have the character of Christ in you. You're falling short. And God doesn't expect Christ fully in you. But he expects you to make the, the attempt to continue to, you know, it's not the arrival, 
It's the striving that's important. Not the arriving, but the striving. Paul said that, not that I have arrived, but I proceed toward the mark of a high calling in Christ Jesus. And that's where we are. Anybody who says that you've got to be perfect, they're lying to you. But you have to be striving. You have to be striving. If you're satisfied with who you are and where you are, you're not striving, folks, because you don't know how filthy and un unacceptable you are without Jesus. We are all unacceptable without Jesus. We may be, uh, look pretty good compared to each other, but stand up against perfection. And suddenly you don't look so good. But the God we serve is perfection. Amen? And that wonderful God says, if you're striving, I will wrap you in an insulating cloak. I will change you. I will make you fit to be in my holy presence. But if you think you can get here on your own power, think again. Monsters of iniquity without Christ. 1 Corinthians 2.12 says, We have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have, made, have been made freely given to us by God. And what things are they? And I'm finishing with this. 2 Peter 1, 3 to 8. You'll hear this from me over and over again because it's so important. God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Everybody wants life. You better start to want godliness, folks. Because without that desire, you're not about to get it. And without it, you will fall short. He's given us this through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. That's Jesus. He said, come, follow me. Take my yoke upon you. Let me do the pulling. That's what he's saying. Let me do the pulling. Connect to me. I'll do the pulling. I'll be gentle. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises. Why? So that through them, you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires, that we may be partakers of the very nature of God. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness. See, make the effort. Strive. It's not arriving, it's striving. That's important. Make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness and to godliness brotherly, brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness love. Love. That's agape. It's not phileo. Oh, it's agape. It's good to have phileo. It's good to, to phileo each other, to have fondness for each other. But God's not talking about that. He's talking about agape. He's talking about sacrificial love. Doing those things that are part of God's character regardless of how you feel about somebody. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, you will, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. That knowledge is experiential knowledge. Epigenosis. Knowledge that covers. That's what it is. Gnosis is knowledge. But epigenosis is the covering knowledge. The knowledge that covers you. This is experiential knowledge. This is not just data peaks, people. This is what lives within you. Within you 
inside of you and comes out of you as a result of it. Praise God. I hope I've made some progress here this morning because it's my desire that I get in this pulpit to, to give knowledge of the holy to you. To see where you are and where you're going and how to get there. That's, you know, we're like seeds in the ground. This is all preliminary. This is all the beginning. And a seed has to be nourished. If it's not nourished, it will not grow into what it's designed to be. Amen? So if there's nothing else taken from this message, message today, take at least this. It's not what you do that's important. It's who you become that's important. When you become what he makes you, then you will do that which is important. But it must start with who you are, not what you do. Amen? Amen.